That's better. Okay. So I can just turn my video off. Right? Yeah, turn your mute audio. Um, so it'll be live stream. or so.
Okay. We'll stand up. Hello, everybody. Thanks for, for coming. Um, we are very, very happy to have Steve Portugal for our first uh, ETNF design speaker series. Um, there's a lot of people watching online and ETNF folks at other locations. Um, so happy to have those people as well. Um, yeah, we're super excited about Steve and, and his research um, and his, his, uh, his design that his design consulting firm and, and all the fun things that he does. So I do Steve Portugal. Thanks everybody. All right. Thanks everyone. And uh, I'm in a room with a bunch of people and I'll be talking to you guys and I'll try to keep in mind that oh, there's people out there in the in the tubes that are that are listening and, and watching. So I may forget that you're there, but I'll, I'll try to remember. Uh, so I'm going to talk about bad ideas and, and what that means and what we could do with it. Um, yeah, well, this here, here you know, I'm in, in very cold DC, and this is where I normally spend my work day uh, on the, near the Pacific, not in the Pacific Ocean, but near the Pacific Ocean in Pacifica, outside of San Francisco. So I know you guys are all cold, and uh, like I'm, I'm, my face was hurting last night, so I'm impressed with people that can manage this. Um, you know, uh, Nick interviewed me uh, ahead of this, and we talked about a lot of research stuff. And I said, well, I'm not going to talk a lot about research, you know, as it's as thought about in the UX world. I'm going to talk about something adjacent, but uh, but related. So if you want to know more about research stuff, there's a lot of resources uh, at the page that Rosenfeld hosts for my book. Um, just lots of templates and examples and talks and so on. So, you know, I'll sort of send you to that site for that kind of content and talk about something different today. Um, and today is about the bad idea. And I'm talking about the, there's a creative impulse around bad ideas that I want to talk about. It's really more a process discussion. Uh, you know, how do we how do we tap into what bad ideas are and let's see what happens with bad ideas when they leave the sketchbook and find their way into the world and um, God, I can't believe I'm going to say this. What happens next may surprise you. All right, everyone just everyone just walked out of the room. Um, and then, you know, why, why are we talking about this? You know, what, what's this? What's the application of this? Um, uh, so DTDT is, uh, does anyone know what that stands for? Defining the damn thing, um, and and you know in the user experience world there seems to be a lot of desire to define things, um, and something that people can argue about. But I I own this discussion for now unless someone wants to debate it. Um, but so here's what I mean by bad. I'm going to define my terms here. It's not about the absence. It, it's it's not the absence of good. It's not meh. Like bad is something stronger, um, and it's not just it's it's not just like uh. That's kind of dumb. It's like, ah, you're trying to like really, when we look for something that's bad, you're trying to get that, just that visceral kind of response. Um, and so think about dangerous, immoral, and, 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 and bad for the organization, bad for business. That's kind of what I mean by bad. Um, and I'm going to start with an exercise as we kind of look at the creative process. Um, so people that are in the room, you all have a, a post-it notes. Uh, People that are on the interwebs can do this on Twitter because it's a little, you, you're going to need to give your thing to somebody. I'm, I'm, tr I'm uh, relieving a bit of the process here. Um, so you'll do a hashtag bad idea. But anyway, people that are in the room, take your post-its. You have, should have two. Take, the, take one of them. Take a pen. Um, come up with a bad idea for a product or service. So the example in this, in this screen is... Um, is candy for breakfast. It's a kid cereal that's, that's specifically candy. <laughs> okay. What's, yeah. <laughs> you, okay, just, so come up with sort of like the worst thing. And, you know, I'd say keep it either the domain that you're working in. Like, look for something, something kind of else. Does anybody not know what I'm asking them to do with this? Need a little clarification? Some people are just all the way coming up with something bad. Write it down. People in the room, you guys write something? Have you done it? No, thinking. Okay, okay you're yeah. thinking? Yeah. I didn't know there was going to be thinking required. <laughs> I'll give you just a minute to do this. Do 
so people in the room have post-its because we're going to share. People on the internet, I'm suggesting a hashtag so you can pick up somebody else's thing when we move on to the next step. Come on in. We're, we're just doing an activity. Okay, just give a few more seconds here. Okay, so here's the next step. I'll describe it and then, um, well, so let's just do this right now. T take your idea and hand it off to somebody else. You, don't, you, you can train or pass along. It doesn't matter kind of how it works. Just make sure. Make sure you got something that you didn't come up with. <laughs> That's good. There's a lot of like, what the heck? Okay, so here's the next step, step of the activity. Just because, give me a sec to describe this, then you can go ahead and do it. Um, I want you to, des to design the circumstances whereby that bad idea becomes a good idea. So in my example, uh, candy for breakfast, which maybe was a good idea to begin with. But um, so let's just say let's we agree it's a bad idea, and we're going to try to reframe it here. So the, the circumstances I might design in the second part is say, like, OK, um, you know, you've heard of colony collapse disorder, right? There was problems with bees and, you know, it's, let's sort of imagine five years from now we have real problems with the food um, cycle and we're, get, we're losing access to sucrose. And so, you know, kids are having nutrition problems and so we put candy for breakfast, it kind of becomes a nutritional imperative and that's how we kind of get around this. Don't, don't look too closely at my thing, right? I'm just not, like, that's not necessarily a good solution. But, you know, without thinking too hard, so that's kind of what I want you to do. People on Twitter, to pick up a hashtag bad idea and then do the same activity and then write it on Twitter as hashtag good idea. So people in the room, everybody know what your next part of this activity is? Okay. Use the second sticky note to write Yes, I'm sorry. Very good. The second sticky note is for coming up with your good idea. If you can come up with more, that's fine. No, don't come up with extra ideas. That's not allowed. <laughs> I know, yes. We won't go through all of them, but I want to hear from some people about ones that what they did. So if you're willing to share, get ready. to go down and then we'll
see what we got. Okay, let's start. I'd love, love to hear from a couple of people, and I guess I'll repeat so that we can, uh, uh, so this will go out over the stream. Um, so, who wants to go? What's the what's the bad idea that you got, and then what's the good idea that you created? Good morning. Hi. Um, Sonia's bad idea was snowboarding in a swimsuit. Snowboarding in a swimsuit. Yeah. Nice. Like, the, the, the like right, okay. So the, the, it's the same activity, but you create a new context. Uh, snowboarding in a swimsuit, but the proceeds go to the, the Komen Foundation. I, you said it better than I did, but okay. Like the ice, the, 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 the polar bear plunge. That's a great reframe. Good, I like that one. That's really, okay, there's a, lot, there's a lot to that one. That's very simple, but there's a lot to that. Please. Uh, so he came up with uh, some new keyboard key. Okay, so it's a new keyboard layout with uh, uh, destroy all, where the return key is near destroy all. What was the other one? Delete? Yeah, uh, well, destroy and then delete all, and then return is ah, all. Destroy, delete all, and return are all kind of newly, newly rearranged. Okay. Um, so I thought that that might be a good idea for uh, kind of like new methods for creative writing. So like the, the leave it in base hands keyboard. Um, and so <laughs> the idea would be that, uh, you know, this generates uh, new creativity. That's awesome. So just to repeat, it's a it's sort of a, a leave it in fate's hand approach to it's a keyboard for creative writing that kind of changes how you go about writing because those mistakes that you're going to make are going to then kind of send you down different creative paths. Yeah. Awesome. R okay, I'm like so happy. These are great so far. <laughs> wow. Who else wants to go? Now I feel not, not to intimidate anyone else, but. <laughs> Dazzle me. Yes, you are. Julie, Julie said, um, have a job announcement. She works for USA Jobs with just the job titles, management and program analyst, and then a button that says apply. Okay. So my thought is, since we all know that when you go in and you see all the descriptions, which she has left out, you tweak your, your, your application or your resume to fit that description. So would this make it a fairer process? You just go in and, and your narrative describe everything you do daily, all of your previous responsibilities, yada, 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 and then it becomes their issue to figure out if you fit that job. That's Does cool. That that's cool. Okay, so the, the, the bad idea was basically a, a job, uh, job application technology where it's just an apply button and like there's just the, just the title. And what you're saying is that, um, that, you know, that, that that may make it fairer because you kind of, you apply into the void but, but you're putting your corners, your sort of your everyday stuff is going in there and it, it kind of shifts the burden on the hiring people to, to do a better job at filtering and sorting to kind of find people. That's cool. I mean, you've now just, your, your reframe has totally upended the whole dynamic in, in hiring and in, 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 in employment in general. There's like a big, big idea in your, in your good idea. That's great. Good, let's just do one more. If there is one more. Uh, all right, uh, so Natalie gave me a um, bad idea of putting a very unready draft of something like up on the internet. And so the uh, good idea, that, uh, the context would be maybe you're testing an idea for a very long book, it would take a lot of effort, you're doing this before it's written. So maybe that would make that a good thing. So the bad idea is to put something up online that's not ready for prime time at all, like, like a draft, like a long draft of something. And, 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 and the good idea is that that's sort of a, a prototype for something that you know, gets kind of a, a exposed and critiqued and, and, and built up. That's cool. Did anybody have uh, anything with like children and electricity and breaking glass and? <laughs> nice. Okay. <laughs> a colorful, super sharp steak knife set for toddlers. And I want to hear the reframe. I sh but I, there's always one about that. I like where you guys went with this, which is just uh, like a little different and, and nice. Uh, but there always is something that harms children with <laughs> sharp or electricity or something. So I'm very happy. I just I feel like okay, good, we've got that one. So what what's the uh, what's the reframe? Why did two split spheres of butterfly? One was your own 
Nice. Okay. So one was a uh, a way to quickly untie your your sister your sister, your sister, for, you your sister from the campfire that you made in the family room. Yeah, so it's a it's a good idea with a bad idea context <laughs> that gets created. And the other is a way to quickly pop all the balloons left over from your from your birthday party. That's great. Um, so I mean, it's a simple exercise, and it's kind of silly. And you know, the first time someone did this in a session that I was in, when I, mean, I learned that uh, you can take, I think, pretty much any bad idea and with the kind of creativity that you guys are showing is turn it into a, into a good idea. Um, and so that, you know, I just tried to define the damn thing with bad ideas, but I think in this exercise, we've just messed it up a little bit, like, or a lot. Um, so even though I kind of put my foot down and said, here's what a bad idea is, I think it starts to get squishier, which is why bad ideas are worth talking about, because uh, in, in a, you guys just turn them into, into good ideas. I um, mean, qualified good ideas, it's a play exercise, but this, this form of you know, creativity and so on, I think is really interesting. Um, yeah, let's, let's keep going. So uh, just shifting a little bit to you know, brainstorm sessions. You know, we're generating ideas. So here's the thing that I, I see happen uh, just from leading groups through this over, over years um, is you get this kind of this bell curve of, uh, you know, here's, uh, it's the pace of idea generation kind of goes up as you move into it and you hit this peak and you're coming up with lots and lots of things and then you reach this kind of almost a denouement. You're like, okay, that's it. We got it. We've kind of, we're out of ideas. We've, we've kind of covered everything and, 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 and that's, that's great. Um, but it's almost like uh, anyone that's old enough to remember the 80s, there was uh, sort of the rock song thing where these songs would, you know, crescendo and then fade out and you'd be like, okay, we're done. But if you let it play, it like, it came back and there was like, it went all the way, volume zero, all the way back for like one more, uh, you know, hit of the, of the chorus. And I think, you know, audiences would start to clap in, in live shows. They'd hear the fade out. And they're like, okay, the song is done. The song isn't done, it, it comes back. And that's what happens with idea generation is, uh, there's a whole second piece that happens. And, um, you know, the ideas that you come up with in the first hump are important. But those are typically what I observe kind of hygiene. Those are fixing the known defects in your thing. Those are catching up with the Jones as your competitors. It's bringing it up to spec. Uh, and those are all things that need to get done and that should be done. Um, but, and you need to capture them, but that's not all that brainstorming can produce. It can produce the kinds of ideas that you haven't come up with yet, that are, that are sort of disconnected and, um, you know, I call them innovative breakthrough and wacky. Uh, and I don't mean that, none of, it's not that all of these ideas are all good in either hump, but it's a form of thinking that happens in the second hump. I feel like I gotta stop saying the word hump, it's just a, <laughs> I mentioned the 80s, and now I'm like, my language is decades old. Um, the, uh, the, whatever, I don't, now I don't have another word. Um, this is a really interesting part of the talk now. We've gone, we've gone really meta. Uh, I mean, I think this kind of idea generation in the second part is, uh, is what we need to get to, uh, to solve problems in new ways, to get at the more complicated stuff. Um, and you kind of get, you're kind of butting up against the edge of what's allowable, what makes sense, what's, what's permissible, what you would sort of normally recommend. But it's this kind of creativity is where, you know, encourage people to be generating. Other stuff comes out you can make use of besides sort of the, the hygiene piece. There's a thing that happens in this first half is you, you know, when you... facilitating like hey we're done early like as if that's a good thing they've kind of like solved it as opposed to uh, you know kind of keeping going so sometimes when I facilitate I'll go and I mean I'll, I'll show this to people but then I'll go and kind of poke them and like you know give them an example of just a ridiculous idea of a bad idea as a way to give them permission and, and you know to try to get to that second half where other kinds of thinking is taking place um, you know, and, and bad ideas. I mean, I saw you guys do this when you were passing the post-it notes around. There was just some, some giggling, some, some good-natured, you know, creativity that was not about, you know, getting to the heart of the problem, but just was exploring what you guys could do together. 
Um, and that's, you know, the, the, the team cohesion and creativity also gets replenished when people start having these, these conversations. So I'm trying to take the, you know, that notion of we're driving towards a solution and shift it towards here's how we're working together and kind of generating different kinds of things. And there's a really important aspect here, um, and I was sort of, as I was thinking of coming and talking to you guys about this, um, I don't know how to deal with this, so I, want, I, I think this is a, an important thing to address, um, and maybe it's a takeaway for you guys to try to sort out. I don't know the culture of working in government. I just, I, I don't. Um, you know, maybe maybe different for you guys. I, I'm going to hypothesize that it is uh, being able to say and, and and documenting it. And I can imagine a scenario where, like, yeah, that that does that's not that's not how we want to work. Um, you know, and there's there's always examples. I guess you see them in corporate world a lot. Examples of things that get out in the wild, out of context, and that that becomes embarrassing if not damaging. So I want to acknowledge that that's, that's a challenge for everyone and, a, and maybe a unique one for you guys. Um, but I think it's important to be able to do this. And so the example I have here is uh, uh, the top picture is, uh, is the band Rush. Um, and you know, they, they talked about how they went into the studio and they took on, they took on individually the persona of these members of a fictitious band, of a bad band that they would never want to go see and they started you know throwing ideas musical ideas and kind of you know writing songs as these other folks and it was a way to kind of break them out of their traditional way of doing things so they went kind of into a bad ideas creative mode um, you know if you're rush and those get bootlegged and those get released like there's a risk there I think we all have a, a risk of doing that uh, but what those guys have is is trust uh, with each other, so I think there's a couple of a couple of layers to this safe place. One is one is the way we support each other and that we trust each other uh, to come up with stuff, to just talk in a way that is not directly related to solutions, but uh, but but helps us get there. And the other is just to have an, a, a larger environment where this stuff can be generated. The con it's it's never taken out of context. It's never meant to reflect you know anybody's does. Uh, but it does serve to uh, to facilitate this this kind of creativity. And I think when I'm thinking really in, in the in the context of brainstorming or just you know people being together and being creative, I see two very different kinds of bad ideas, and I think they're both really really important, and they need to be supported differently, but but equally. And the first is what we've been talking more about, which is the deliberately zany idea. I said how I would go around to a group and say, you know, that I can see maybe they're stuck and I might give them a bad idea, like a really crazy thing, like, you know, here is, uh, you know, whatever, I don't know, don't want one in this, but to throw one into their mix to kind of jolt them. So that's the thing that we can all choose to do is say like, hey, what if... Um, you know, what if there was a destroy all key on the keyboard that we would add to this, to, this, to this UI? Like that's something you're doing to provoke. The other thing, and I think this is more subtle but really important as well, which is that moment where you are trying to share something and you're tentative about it. It's not a fully finished idea. And there's something in your head that says like, there's something to this. And so I often hear people say this like, okay, this isn't a really good idea, but... People recognize that, 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 that feeling? Okay. That's a really important moment because you're on to something and you can't quite get it out, you know, fully formed, but you want to put it in the room and maybe someone's going to do something with it. That's why this stuff is so collaborative. So this is where the trust comes in. But you also have to be willing to, um, you know, to articulate that enough to kind of hand it out there. Um, and so that disclaimer, like, this isn't a good idea. It may be a good idea, but you don't have it in a form where you feel comfortable about. So you're not doing that to provoke. You just, you sort of have this imperative, like, there's something here, and it's, it's this. So those are different bad ideas, but they kind of fall under the same label. Um, and so there's, I think, one thing we need to get all be focused on is, is that impulse, you know, where, um, you know, where we hear a bad idea, and then we start doing something with it. I mean, the reason that person A puts that, this isn't a very good idea, into the room 
is to see what someone else does with it. And, and so then you have that moment where like, oh, that makes me think of, like that's what you're trying to trigger with the first thing, but you have to be willing to sort of be triggered by that and hear that and, and hear yourself start to generate new stuff from that. It's just kind of thinking of, you know, things that you hear. Lots, lots of things to think about here. Uh, this was uh, from a post by uh, John Bell. Uh, he talks about the McDonald's theory. Uh, it's, it's the scenario where people are talking about where to go for lunch. Where should we go for lunch? And everyone's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have any ideas. Where should we go for lunch? How about we go to McDonald's? Well, no. What if we do this? Um, so I, I like what he says here. We've broken the ice with the worst possible idea. Um, this is his preference to not go to McDonald's. But so he's, you know, he's kind of beating up on them. Um, and, and so it, 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 it like how it breaks the ice and then people start coming up with stuff. So that's kind of a, you know, a different theory about using the bad idea simply to get people talking about things. Yeah, we, we'll, we'll skip this here. Um, and there's a whole thing here from improv as well. Has anyone done improv? Who was anyone seen improv done? All right, that's so most people have seen that. Um, and, and so we know the, the term yes and, people that don't do it still, everyone knows that phrase, right? That you take something and you say yes to it. And that's kind of how improvisers uh, collaborate. Um, and they have these great phrases like throwing an idea. Um, you know, so you take, you, you can't, you don't do a scene without um, coming in with an idea. It's not just two people just saying, hey, what's going on? I don't know what's going on. It's like, I have a lobster on my head and my, and my, and my scalp is itchy. Like you throw some idea, you are very deliberate, you put something in there. Um, and then this idea of accepting offers. So this is the terminology around their collaboration. When someone says, you know, I have a lobster on my head and my hair is itchy, then you say, yeah, you know, and uh, you know, I've got like a, a huge hairbrush that uh, you know, I could bring out to help you with that. You say yes to it, you ex sorry? I have some butter for you, even better, yes. Um, you, you take these, so you accept it. So that kind of collaboration where there isn't anything and you kind of make something up and it, it takes bad stuff and it just, it takes it someplace that it wants to go. Um, you know, it doesn't work if you respond to the negative. Like, no, that's not a lobster, that's, uh, that's a cat. Like, that just starts to suck the life out of it. That saying yes and adding uh, is just kind of so, so key. Um, and, and, you know, you can actually advance the story, I mean, by coming up with something ridiculous, right? If the, the butter is, you know, now we're putting scalding butter on this person's head, like that's, that's terrible, but of course it moves the story along better than the hairbrush actually does, right? Sort of the worst idea moves things along. Um, I'm going to skip this here, but it's, uh, I'll point you to it. Uh, it's from the show Life's Too Short. I'm going to watch the show. Life's too short. It's uh, Ricky Gervais and Stephen Merchant show, um, and there's a great scene uh, which must be on YouTube. Where uh, it is on YouTube, where uh, Liam Neeson, kind of in his uh, latter-day scary Liam Neeson persona, comes in and wants to do some improvisational comedy, and he's just very he's very scary. And of course, all the yes stuff gets turned into no stuff with him. It's, it's I'm going to send people off to just to watch that as a as a follow-up. It's really, it's very funny, and it's, it's kind of the, uh, people know what dark patterns are. This is kind of a, a UX thing that came out maybe, what, two years ago? It's kind of the, just like pattern libraries for design, but being used for evil uh, to kind of create unwanted, uh, well, desired results for the, the dark master, but not for the end user. So this is kind of the yes stuff I was just talking about uh, for improv taken to this, to this dark, this darker place uh, by n the darkest person, Liam Neeson. Uh, I th think th another thing that happens when we start raising things and framing them as bad ideas is that it brings into relief, well, what are our criteria for good or bad ideas? Because we probably haven't articulated that. Uh, so it starts to, it, it takes something implicit about boundaries and starts to make it a little more explicit. Um, so sometimes what happens is someone says something that, and this happened at the beginning, right? I Suggested, well, maybe that's a good idea. Like, why is that a bad idea? Uh, if I got if I got your pushback, you know, appropriately. So, I mean, that's exactly that moment where you say, "Oh, I think this is a bad idea," and I'm presenting it as such. 
and someone says, well, wait a minute, it's actually not a bad idea, and there's actually a precedent for it, this is how someone else does it, um, and let's, you know, let's figure out what we mean by good or bad. And we, we talk about deferring evaluation um, in, in, in idea generation, but sometimes it's helpful to think about, uh, even if we don't evaluate it, let's just surface the criteria that we have for talking about what's good or bad. Um, so if it's not good, well, what is it about it that's bad? Like, let's bring that into the room. So it's a bit of a sidetrack from just idea generation, but it's a great opportunity to, to surface those things. Well, here's an example from a, a, a profile of a Broadway director, this guy, Daniel Auken. Um, and so he was, you know, bringing in a new, uh, it was a new show, and he brought in a new actor, and he was asking her to do it badly. Um, and she was really having a, a hard time. She says, I want to do it right immediately. Um, and, and in fact, so what, what he's trying to do really is find the envelope. Like, where, where could this character go? Where could the story go? It's written. I have a vision of it. Now we can kind of put some places in, uh, some people in place, and start to make things happen. So he's kind of prototyping and asking the, the actor to be creative and even do bad things, kind of go against their impulses to see what the parameters were and what the space is. Um, and if you've ever, if you ever had the chance to see Jeffrey Tambor's acting workshop, uh, it's really like one of the most amazing things I've ever seen around creativity. He, uh, he does it at South by Southwest some years, he does it at a lot of places. Um, it's just really amazing and he brings these actors on stage and they have not really rehearsed the scene. They've memorized some of the lines and he just pushes them to do it. Do it like this, now do it like that, now shout, now do it in an accent that you don't do very well. And he's really just pushing them and pushing the content to kind of see what it could be. Um, people remember Deep Thoughts. This is kind of a generational thing too, but um, there's a great uh, story for about this uh, um, uh, poetry instructor who brought in Deep Thoughts for her students who I think were just young enough they didn't necessarily know it, so they were encountering it for the first time. Um, and um, they started off, they, they wrote better kind of when they started off with writing those and they, you know, they did kind of the, the lousy first draft. They started writing sort of in this cheesy, uh, this cheesy mode, this, this parody mode, um, you know, but they kind of were able to transcend, I like how they call it phony enlightenment. Um, they got, they kind of went beyond that. So, I mean, here's kind of serious education around sort of serious creativity and they were using something just silly to kind of break beyond it. Um, let me just skip ahead here. Um, so just some things about, you know, what happens with, things start out as bad ideas and then they, they sometimes they be why that's subjective. I like this quote about uh, Breaking Bad and, and uh, I, I, it made me think about when I first heard about this show, I'm like, well, this sounds like a terrible show. I don't want to watch that show. Um, and, you know, Vince Gilligan even says that. If you come up with a worse idea on paper for a TV show, um, I don't know if you could, unless you're actually trying to fail. Um, so, you know, this is kind of at the height of its popularity. He, re he could still kind of harken back to when he sort of knew this was not a, quote, good idea. Um, obviously, there's a whole thing here about execution versus the idea. But, you know, uh, executions don't get made. Like, ideas get funded. Um, you know, and, and so it's an interesting kind of reframe here on that. Um, there's a long, long post here uh, where, uh, I think it was about a year ago, the uh, brainstorm sessions were transcribed when Lucas and Spielberg got together to talk about Raiders of the Lost Ark. They met for like several days. Um, and so this one blog they kind of went through and, 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 and kind of reviewed it. Um, and they were reacting to the, you know, the... the the interactions and that Spielberg was coming up with a lot of stuff that in these transcripts was just terrible. And the person reading, reading this in this podcast, he, in script notes, he kind of talks about like, oh, Spielberg's a dud. He's coming up with the terrible things. I thought he was great. You know, he's been this great director my whole life. And, um, but then he kind of, he's reading and he sort of sees, he sees Spielberg's process, which is sort of bad idea, bad idea, bad idea, bad idea. Like, here's exactly what we filmed kind of comes out. Um, and so this, this creative process is interesting. Spielberg is not afraid to throw bad ideas out. Um, uh, and, you know, these podcasters are kind of judging the process decades later out of context. But 
Um, it's interesting to kind of go through it and see the good ideas and the bad ideas in this mix and, 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 the, um, and then how that stuff ended up in the final product. Here's another example, um, cow clicker. Has anyone heard of cow clicker? This is uh, something by uh, Ian Bogost, who is um, just like brilliant, cynical, kind of cultural critic, game theorist. Um, writes a lot of interesting things about uh, technology and certainly games, but um, he came up with this, it's almost like a piece of, of like technological social criticism. Um, I think it's sort of the like complete reduction of sort of Farmville and all those types of games. As far as I understand it, it's cows and you click on them. And I think maybe they, they change, they change in other kinds of things. Um, you know, and so he created it as a, as a joke, as a, as a critique, and um, it became his most successful game. And I like this quote from the Wired article, um, it enslaved him and many of its players for much of the past 18 months. He can't decide whether it represents his greatest success or his most colossal failure. I mean, the scope of the demand for this thing, which was meant to be, uh, you know, commentary and not actually playable, um, was, and this is, this is, I think, one of our most articulate and thoughtful uh, people around games and gaming, and he you know, made a product that was meant to not be good, and it turned out to be good, sort of despite what we all understand it, uh, about it. So, um, you know, again, bad idea became a good idea. Again, depending on how we want to, you know, label either of those things. Uh, this thing, Jotly, um, they made a, a, a joke video uh, that kind of went around, circulated around Silicon Valley. It was, you could rate everything. It was kind of like the ultimate check-in app. So, like, you know, there's some checking in and, and rating and, and sharing of, the, uh, of that guy's ice cube uh, in, in this video. Um, it was a parody video, and it was, you know, you can imagine sort of how well realized it was. Um, uh, they were, there was, a, uh, the VCs were competing for backing within a couple of months. Like, it became a thing. Like, someone said, like, oh, actually, we want to give you money to make this thing that you made this silly video about. Um, you know, and so maybe there's something there about, you know, how funding for startups is being thought about. But, again, there's a success of a form that came out uh, where the intention was not to make a good thing that would go out there in the world. It was intended as a bad idea. I won't subject you to these videos, but um, we were talking SNL before we started. Um, here's uh, 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 Sebastian Bach and, uh, uh, no, sorry, it's Axel and Slash. I can't remember if, if Sebastian Bach. Oh, Sebastian Bach is playing Axel, I think, in this sketch. Um, anyway, it's, uh, it's uh, bedtime songs for kids sung heavy metal. You know, so great. I mean, SNL is a great source of bad ideas um, that they'll like, present as products. Um, but then, you know, uh, uh, like just last year, or 2012, uh, Neil Young came out with uh, an album of uh, kind of crazy horse grunge rock uh, uh, aesthetic of, um, you know, Americana songs. Um, you know, Clementine, Oh Susanna, songs we sang as kids sometimes in school and stuff. It's kind of done in this genre. Um, so, it's you know, I think there's something here about humor where something that's done to be funny actually has, you know, has some roots in creating something that maybe is good. I happen to really like this album despite my reaction when I heard of the idea. I'm like, this is, I don't want to hear this at all. But, um, and Neil Young is kind of the classic, you know, rock and roll is about bad ideas, I think. It's, it's kind of an aesthetic and a, you know, a way of, of, of creating art. Um, and Neil Young, is, I think, is the ultimate in this, and he has this great quote from decades ago uh, when he became very successful with the song Heart of Gold in the 70s. And he said, uh, Heart of Gold put me in the middle of the road. Traveling there soon became a bore, so I headed for the ditch. A rougher ride, but I met more interesting people there. So kind of he devoted himself to, to the bad ideas, to, to kind of that, that, that pathway. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. These, yeah, these books, uh, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Has anyone read these books? You read the books? Okay, cool. Um, the, there's, this, th these books were in on the joke, right? There's sort of a, an element of satire here, and it, it, it's a ludicrous premise, and you can have fun with it. Um, you know, and you, you could almost miss the joke. It's just done so elegantly, I think, if you're moving quickly. Um, then it became, I'm not going to show you, that there's, I have a long uh, bit of the trailer here, which I won't make you sit through as well. 
Um, but then there was this movie. Did anyone see the movie? You, you must have seen the movie if you read the books. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Give me something here. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, and the, the trailer is just, and I don't know about the movie, but the trailer is like all the humor that's here is sucked out of the trailer. It looks extremely like a serious, ponderous action film like we're sort of drowning in right now. It could have been something like, uh, you know, uh, like a Marvel Comics, you know. There's not a lot of irony in the Marvel Comics superhero movies. Um, and so something that was, you know, a bad idea that we all get then got, seemed to be treated like it's a good idea. Well, of course, Abraham Lincoln is a, he's a vampire hunter and this happens and he has this axe and he does this and... Um, you know, it, so the movie did, I think, all right. It, it, it didn't flop financially. I don't think it was intended to succeed critically. But, you know, look at its roots from this um, sort of sarcastic, whimsical thing to sort of a serious, uh, this is exactly what it should be. So, you know, it, this, again, we're sort of tracking good and bad ideas when they, they find their way into the world. Um, this is sort of, you know, what one of my friends calls stunt food. Um, Black walnut ice cream with a sweet, spicy fried chicken chunks and a cayenne maple drizzle. Um, and, you know, I'm seeing some unhappy faces here, but someone who's probably now I'm shaming them is kind of going like, that sounds good. That sounds good. Thank you. That's good. I like this kind of stuff. I mean, I like sort of this, this interesting kind of food. Uh, this one personally grossed me out, but, you know, um, you know, bacon donuts is, you know, it's kind of old hat now, but it's still some people are like, what? That's, that's disgusting. Um, so there's kind of a bad idea aesthetic in food right now. We're putting things that don't go together together, and people say, that sounds good. And some people are like, ugh. Um, and so I like this one here. This is a uh, rogue brewery in, in, uh, in Oregon, and they created a flavor of beer that's based on the donuts from Voodoo Donuts in Portland, which if you ever go to Portland, Oregon, you should go to Voodoo Donuts. Um, so it's, the, it's a beer with the flavor of the bacon maple donut. I like it's not bacon maple flavor, it's bacon maple donut flavor. And it actually does taste like that donut, which is kind of an amazing thing. Um, you know, and they're doing it here for kind of for fun. I mean, this is, there's something here about brand. You know, the brand of Rogue is kind of curating and endorsed by the brand of Voodoo. So there's kind of a narrative here that makes sense around, around these brands. Uh, when Tarani came out with chicken and waffles syrup, like this, I think this doesn't work. Um, I think this was an April Fool's, uh, you know, fake press release from their newsletter, and people said like, "Hey, you should do this," so they did it. But this is, to me, is off brand for Tarani. So this doesn't seem like they shouldn't be playing around with this. Like Joan Soda, you know, has the the poutine flavored soda, and like so that's their story. It's it's a, you know that's they're all about bad ideas and gross flavors, which you would probably really like. Right. And soda. Right. There we go. I see. The saying yes. I mean, whether you believe it or not, I appreciate the the enthusiasm. Yeah, I haven't tried these, and maybe they're gross, but that's what that's. This is a good idea for them. Um, you know, these bad ideas are not right for everybody, but that's they're kind of the curator of that. Okay, slightly different direction. Uh, sometimes bad ideas are bad. Um, and uh, people remember this. This was, uh, you know, this was a concept sketch that, that came out um, that got a lot of people appropriately upset. Um, you know, this was not the right image for the demographic that this product was being uh, sold to. Um, you know, and so they pulled it back. They apologized. And, you know, I read some quotes from the, the designer who was not, they weren't aware of how it was being perceived. They, they were really thinking about something they played with as a kid um, and, uh, and, and they just sort of earnestly followed it through. Um, but that, so it started off as the intention was a good idea. No one really looked at it and say it was a bad idea. Uh, concept sketches kind of leaked and they had to you know, pull it back as they should have. Uh, but so there's, you know, I think the sort of the subjectivity of good and bad ideas is uh, worth thinking about. Um, and I think sometimes beyond our control, this is uh, South by Southwest a few years ago. I don't know if people remember this. They uh, hired homeless people to be homeless hotspots, they, they were calling it. It was like a PR agency's uh, thing. And so, you know, these guys got money and they would, you know, walk around. You have these people with smartphones, a huge crush of people. You need bandwidth. And so they were, they were, they had some technology with them that they were kind of carrying. Um, this was exploitation. 
this, you know, this was a lot of people kind of wringing hands about this. It was, you know, inappropriate. These guys all apologized. Um, but it, no one talked about this, which was at the same event. Um, uh, these were not FedEx delivery people. These were actors hired through Craigslist that were wearing uh, suits with, like, huge lithium batteries in them, like flat, flat batteries. Uh, and it was, you know, 90 degrees there. Um, and they were walking around. You could plug into the person and charge your device. To me, it's the same concept. Um, but, you know, the, the people that were being turned into machines were uh, more or less empowered. I mean, I think that's sort of the, the narrative here. Um, you know, no one got upset about this, and, and I'm not saying it's as simple as I'm making it out to be. I think there are reasons to be concerned about doing this, but I think it's, it's, it's you know, there's something that happened. This ended up with some bad PR. It became a bad idea. Uh, no one wanted to talk about this, and so, yeah, without sort of further analyzing our culture and our kind of, you know, the, the politics uh, that are behind all this, um, you know, Ideas come out, and there's this—you know—one idea is terribly bad, and one idea is kind of is kind of neutral. So, part of this is to say, like, this is beyond our control a certain amount. I mean, the you know, working through what's good and bad sometimes doesn't get fully worked out until it ends up in the in the in the world. And sometimes I take some heat for saying that because I don't have a magic formula for you. Well, do this. You know, if you're going to have homeless people, don't do it. But if you're going to have you know, Craigslist actors then do it. It's not, you know, we don't know. It's not foreseeable. But this is kind of the calculus that I think we're negotiating with good and bad. Oh, yeah, here's a piece of art that ends up a kind of a bad idea thing. Um, it's, a, it's a glass crib. Um, and it's meant to be a provocation. Uh, so let me just talk a little bit about the kind of thinking that, that, that goes into bad ideas, uh, just to kind of wrap up with a few more slides. Um, there's a site, I don't think it's active anymore, but the site Big Think had these provocations that they were calling dangerous ideas. You know, so things like, you know, make software free or don't pay for special education or tax fat people. Um, they would put these ideas out and then kind of have commentary. And, you know, part of it is it's the same, it's the safe place thing I said at the beginning, right? It's a, it's a site that says, like, look, let's set, let's set aside our, you know, why these ideas upset us and our kind of morals and judgment. And then let's look at these from a dispassionate perspective and see kind of what's in them. And they're not, this is, they're not advocating for doing any of these things. They're trying to facilitate a discussion that we don't easily have to try to look at what's behind it and where it takes us. And the classic example of this, did people study this in school? Anyone? A modest proposal? Jonathan Swift? Yeah. Right, this was saying that... Um, that uh, the basically the, the, the poor people in, in Ireland could, uh, sell, um, could sell their uh, babies to the rich who would pay to eat them. Uh, and, you know, it's a great piece of writing, which I think is why you study it in school, because it, it kind of lays out the case for it in a, in a fairly dispassionate and logical way. And it's satire. And it's not funny. It's certainly not funny to a school kid, in, you know, in our time. But um, I think at that point it was trying to talk about what was going on in a way that you couldn't otherwise talk about. So, you know, bad ideas have the role for that. Um, bad ideas, you know, just like that uh, Jotley example, I mean, I think the drone conversations are amazing as you just track this over the years. The, uh, the, the robots that deliver tacos uh, was, um, you know, it was a, it was a hoax. Um, uh, it was just meant to be silly. They created like a, you know, f a website and so on. Um, and it's hard to track, but I think at some point they were getting funding for this, um, which is not even that exciting anymore because we've now got you know, drones sending beer to music festivals and Domino's Pizza is prototyping them. And then there's this is an actual video, I think, of like a sushi delivery in, uh, like in London at a company called Yo Sushi. And I mean, they go on and on and on. Uh, Burrito Bomber. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, Burrito Bomber has a GitHub page with code for it. And, um, so people start taking these things that are bad ideas and start kind of building them. And then, you know, Amazon said that they're going to do it and Bezos went on TV. And so, you know, I mean, it, it, it all, it's not that the taco copter people had the idea first, but they kind of put it out as a bad idea. And then, you know, it's actually a thing that's happening. It's still a, a promotion, but it's still, it's out there. Um, yeah, more Simpsons things. We can skip some of those. Um, oh, I like this. Someone made a fake trailer for a Hungry Hungry Hippos horror film. Um, and then actually someone uh, funded the Hungry Hungry Hippos movie. So, 
you know, this line, you know, in certain categories is like really hard to, to parse. There's a big thing here about context. Uh, on the left is uh, this piece of graffiti in Austin that says, I love you so much. Uh, it has a check in place on Swarm that um, actually got painted over and they painted it back. It's like people pose there. Um, but it sort of straddles the line between sort of public, you know, a, 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 a public space and, uh, you know, graffiti, right? And, and then on the right uh, is a piece of artwork by uh, Tracy Emin, which says, I never stop loving you. Uh, so the format is different, but the content is basically the same. It's a scripted message of love. Uh, one's in, a, in an art gallery in Australia, and one is uh, you know, a local landmark. So, you know, again, these, these different contexts we have to look out for. Um, or, or, or a photograph of the artwork you know, becomes a thing as well, becomes kind of a brand element. All right, so just to wrap up here, yeah, I'm going to sk skip this slide. It's boring. Um, yes, so to quote Thomas Paine from The Age of Reason, which is, you know, why you asked me here, uh, the sublime and the ridiculous are often so nearly related that it's difficult to class them separately. Or um, <laughs> it's such a fine line between stupid and clever. So that's, that's it for me. Uh, love to get thoughts, comments, questions with the time that we have left. No bad ideas. So, so um, when you sort of coach uh, people to maybe put some of this into practice, are you doing that in like sort of brainstorm workshops? You sort of, um, I guess, how does that... How do, you, how do you sort of try to get this into action? Yeah, so the question is, how do I get this into action? What happens with this? Um, I think two things. One is doing what I'm doing today, which is just talking about this to people, and it's kind of, kind of at, at, a, at a large remove, kind of a little bit of broad change agency. I want people to be thinking and talking about this. Um, and, uh, you know, I've had people come back to me after some of these talks and say, like, oh, we use this, and this, and this is what's happened. Um, in a more hands-on way, Yes, it's kind of what you described. I will, um, you know, if I'm facilitating a brainstorm workshop, I'll show a piece of this. And then, uh, you know, I'll encourage them to do this. And when groups are going around, I'll remind them of the two, the two humps and say, like, hey, remember, we want to get to this other one. And so I might give them a bad idea or kind of, you know, as I'm circulating, I might say, hey, here's a bad idea for you. Uh, or I might encourage them to come. You know, these are all good, you know, in that first hump. What can you come up with in the second hump? So I teach people the model, and then I kind of help them kind of perform to it and make them a little bit self-aware as they're doing it. Yes? Is there a way to uh, hide bad ideas in a way that they're not seeing bad to bad to cause discussion? Is there a way to hide bad ideas? I hide bad ideas. And so, I mean, if it comes out too much as a bad idea, I mean, this is government, so right. shut them down. actually open up this level of discussion without having to like, use the word bad? Or, you know, how do we wrap that up a little bit? Right. I mean, so how do we sort of present ideas that are bad and your question maybe without using the word bad? Yeah. Um, and so I'm using the word bad. I'm, being, I'm trying to hit it head on, right, and say, like, th these are bad. Right. Right. Um, you know, in, in the beginning I talked about, you know, the safe place to have these discussions. Um, and so... Right, I mean, there might be some other language around this. Um, you know, I mean, I think I've used the word provocation like a number of times in this, and that, um, you know, provocations are done. They are not meant to be solutions. They're meant to lead to other thinking. So, I mean, there's provocations in art, right? and there's a lot of sort of, uh, you know, there's provocations in research. You do, you do things to get reactions to. So, um, things as provocations... Uh, might be an interesting way to do it. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I think you run the risk of sort of, if you wrap too much language around or that isn't authentic, you end up taking away, I think, the very natural aspect of it. Um, but I, I agree with you that it has to be done in a way that supports kind of how people work. Continues to live necessarily. Um, so the comment was that you know that it seems like I'm pairing bad ideas with good ideas, and and and, 
I guess maybe not. I mean, I think in, you know, in a brainstorm, you're just generating a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot without evaluating. Um, and sometimes what starts off as bad turns out not to be bad. So, I mean, I think that's also the risk of, you know, of putting bad ideas in a box and saying these are only provocations because there's the possibility that I will say a bad idea and you will come up with the next idea. You will yes and, and the good idea is right there. And so uh, I think there's something about, I don't know, I haven't really fully analyzed this, but there's something about, you know, we're going out on a limb together, literally, when we say, like, well, what about this? And someone kind of pulls us back. You know, I think that, I think that dynamic. And so the, there's a, I think the risk uh, of, you know, there's... Uh, like when I've gotten up in front of groups to your question, sort of how do I use this, when I say to them, we're going to do this and you come up with things that are immoral and bad for business, and everyone kind of giggles because I've just given them permission to think and talk away in this room, in this session, that they're not used to doing. Um, and I think that giggle is a sign of like, oh, I can, like, I can create in a way that maybe I haven't been able to do. Um, and, you know, when you try to hit the target every time, you problem solve in a certain way, and when you are freed from that you problem solve in another way. Um, you know, and anyway, I don't, I, I don't know. I think it's, that risk is a risk, and so how do you kind of mitigate it? And maybe it's around the language, or maybe it's around setting some, you know, some people do brainstorms where they say, like, uh, they, they give you out the rules. Like, IDEO has a card that they have been, you know, using. Like, here's the rules for it. So you might want to sort of manage that session and kind of document, you know, define your terms a little bit and, you know, define what's going to happen to these outcomes and give people permission and just sort of set that up at the beginning so that um, we're kind of mitigating and managing th that risk, but we're also acknowledging it as part of that creative process. I work for OPM and um, we've got a giant project going on right now to kind of change the entire hiring process. Um, and we do a lot of this and we're moving into the ideation phase, so I'm glad I came to this. But we started off by saying there are no, no wrong ideas, no, we didn't label it as good or bad, but nothing is off the table and we list everything and then we drill down from there to develop something from there. And a lot of times as we're developing things, we'll say something and then we ideate all the way up to where it is now, we've used mm. parts of that into a better idea. So. We do use a lot of this, and it, and it works in the government as long as you have, we have our own space in the sub-basement, and we, our team works together, and until we come up with the plan, it doesn't really get presented to anyone, so it's just us working on it, and our team is collaborating to get it done. So and our rule is nothing, what is said here stays here, kind of like Las Vegas, yeah. and whatever happens, and then the big idea comes out of that. That's great. I'm not going to repeat that because I see you making that, because I think you described some best practices for applying this in yeah. government, but I think, I, I think in anywhere, yeah. you know, I think those and are the great. the director of OPM has been involved and she knows what we're doing. She just hasn't been given all the ideas yet because they're not fleshed out all the way. So it does work in government. It's just you have to have, like you said, the right space and the right people working on the project. Right. And you're describing space physically, yes. but also kind of conceptually what the space is for that, for that team to be creative together. To, to solve, to really to generate and solve. That's awesome. Thank you. I'm glad you were here to say that. I was just thinking about how um, the government makes, um, generally makes um, policy changes. You know, put a, like a formal notice in the Federal Register, and if we send something outlandish in, in there, that would end up on the front page of some newspaper. <laughs> but um, what's your what's your thoughts on like maybe the power of the setting where you um, get public feedback like is um, having something like this better than having people put their ideas in writing I mean is um, what do you think I mean I don't know if this is less intimidating to people than so your question is about um, you know, the setting where ideas are kind of put out for yeah, feedback the yeah and so when you say this are you talking about this room that we're literally yeah, in or if we had like a public town hall as right to Uh, uh, so, so there's part of the setting then is, is, what, when, is ideas in writing. There's sort of a formality to documenting them to, um, you know, to kind of discussing them, right? Right, I think, I think documentation is very different than, than riffing, than brainstorming and being creative, right? And, and um, but I, I, hmm, 
my, this is where I, my reference for town hall is Parks and Rec, right? So that's, <laughs> so that, so I don't, you know, I mean, those, uh, those are settings, I think, in which people are saying, I want X, which is different than what if we did Q, right? And I think the process we're describing is, is what if we did Q and what if we did, you know, H, I mean, as opposed to, I want this, can I have it, yes or no? Um, I think that's a very, very different setting, and that's, that's uh, you know, that's like feature requests and software development, you know, it's not looking for solutions. I mean, so I almost think of something like that as input, like, let's try to understand the problem which is being delivered to us uh, through feature requests. Like, I want this to have happen. Okay, either you can ask why, you can infer why, and then you take those needs and objectives back into another kind of environment, like your environment, to say, like, how can we get to that? You're going to say more about that, please. To add a little bit um, for her answer, what we're doing is we've, um, from the beginning, we've brought in all the stakeholders to include policy. So they've been involved in the creation of this whole thing anyway. And we sit in a room together and we use the same concept. What's said here stays here. And we t someone takes notes constantly, but it is not attributed to any one person. And then we have something to back up uh, the idea that we want changed or the policy we want changed. So we have all the data. In fact, right now we have 2,500 pieces of data scattered in our room to prove our point. So when somebody from policy does say, why do you want to change this? You've been involved from the beginning, and this is the idea that came from your creation session, and this is why we want this changed. Does that speak to what you were asking? Yeah, I think it's just tougher to the general public than the community. Yeah, and I mean, I'm not describing a, a, an outward-facing thing. I think a lot of these stories are sort of things end up facing outwards and things happen that you don't expect, like someone funds a ridiculous idea. So, um, you know, that I don't, that's not the recommended path. I think it's sort of proof of the concept that ideas change uh, their value as they kind of go someplace. I would not imagine using kind of public feedback as a way to test bad ideas, you know, government or, you know, or business or anybody. I mean, when you, and this is a big thing in, in when people do, you know, when they expose prototypes to users to kind of do what sometimes is called testing, although I, I hate that word, um, you know, there's a lot of thought that goes into what's, what do you show and what's the fidelity of it so that you can, so you can stage their reaction appropriately. This is not a thing that we're making. This is a thing we want to, you know, help, ask you to help us understand. So to use the existing channels for kind of the public record and so on, I think that's, that's not how people are going to interpret that. And so I think it's, it's, not a good idea for us to use those channels for that, but to you know find other ones like you're describing or you know other things we might come up with. And we have a question from uh, Twitter. Uh, Kara Lewis asks, um, since bad ideas, let me hang on, lost it here. Since bad ideas are judged by the market, we may try to determine good ideas by what we predict will be popular. How do we avoid that? I, I don't know. I mean, I think there's, um, you know, I think part of what I'm saying is that uh, there's an element of this that's beyond our control. Um, and, you know, to, I mean, the homeless hotspots one is like those people intended to do well. And they were very surprised when they got, um, you know, publicly, um, uh, uh, criticized so strongly. So there is, you know, you can do all, this is, you know, I think there's some innovation theory here. You can do all the right things and follow the right process and, you know, generate the way that we're talking about and test and iterate and evaluate and, you know, release things in a controlled way and get feedback and so on. And things just happen. The world is messy and, the, you know, there are external events and things that Things that happen, uh, you know, in the world, in politics, in natural disasters, and you know, weather events. There's all sorts of things that we can't control that change public perception. I mean, uh, I'm even thinking of like the uh, the wardrobe malfunction, at, as they called it in the Super Bowl. Like, was that 10 years ago or something? Like, that's like an interesting watershed moment for what our society suddenly could accept and so you could be doing all the right things you know the week before that and that happens and suddenly the culture just it shifts really dramatically and the marketplace shifts and you can't control that um, so I don't 
have a magic answer to that, I would be, I wouldn't be on Twitter today. I would be like, you know, in a palace if I had the answer to that. So, um, I mean, I think it's, I think it's an important thing to be aware of, but I think it's hard to sort of fix and say do A or B. But so there's my non-answer to that. If anyone wants to hook me up with the palace, then you know, I'm there. So you can actually create an, a process. So what, you know, one of the things I was like, how do we, or is there a way that we can be more aware to find the bad ideal that we use in the wild? Um, and like take those bad ideas that, see, that you have in the wild and then bring them in as a way to kind of iterate from there. Interesting. So finding bad ideas in the wild and, and iterating on them. Yeah. Right, I mean, the, the examples I have are sort of discovered bad ideas, right? That, that they get outed as bad ideas because something happens. But it's interesting sort of conceptual to think about. There's a lot of bad ideas that, well, that FedEx guy, I mean, that's an equally a bad idea. Um, and sort of just no one noticed. Um, and I, I guess we're in sort of a little bit of a postmodern thing, like, can we say what's good or bad? Like, there's some clear points where, you know, products hurt people and, um, you know, companies suffer or, you know, there's, there's, there's definite problems um, that maybe are definitively bad, although I think we probably could have fixed those if we'd done our first exercise with them. Um, but a lot of it's just really slippery and a lot of it is like, well, who's to say what's good or bad? And as much as we sort of try, as we try to, you know, mitigate those things, I think there's just this, there's a, this element that's just beyond our control. Um, and that, you know, I think that's the per point of the first exercise is like, they're sometimes the same thing. Um, so, yeah, it can help us be creative. I don't know that it can help us sort of mitigate these risks, but, you know, that's not really your question or your observation was maybe there's fodder out there for sort of new stuff by going and, you know, finding those and bringing them back. So, yes, and then me, blah, 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 blah. So yes, I'm sorry. So a broader question um, from the HNF perspective, you know, how do you um, do? You have any thoughts on how to kind of set up the environment um, that you were talking about uh, for the kind of requisite like trust um, environment with, you know, if we're going out and, and and working with agencies that, you know, may or most likely have not, you know, worked in these kind of ways, or you know, maybe haven't even done brainstorming. Um, just thoughts on, on how to kind of set that up so we could get, get there. Yeah, and I think it, it makes me think of some of the questions that you and I were going back and forth, which really about kind of consultative type engagements. Or, so how do you set that up? Um, you know, and I think, you know, it's, it's all about how you form the relationship and, you know, how you say, uh, you know, we understand this is what you need. Here's how we think that we can help you. Let us tell you a little bit about how we work. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's um, selling is the wrong word because selling, if you say that word, people think that means persuading someone. And I really mean, um, you know, continually making them aware of what you're doing and how you're doing it and why you're doing it. Um, I, I don't know if we, I think, I can't remember if we talked about uh, kickoff meetings, you know, but that's sort of a moment where a project starts, people get together, they meet each other, um, you know, I'm guessing this space is not what a lot of your, you know, government clients look like. You have sort of, this is more of a contemporary, you know, collaborative kind of environment. I saw open, open office spaces, and I'm guessing that's not the standard. I, I don't know. Um, so, uh, you know, you have a different work culture. So inviting people here for kickoffs, uh, giving them a taste of just the subtle aspects of that. Um, giving them a presentation that says, you know, here's, the, here's how the project's going to go. Here's the milestones. Here's the deliverables. Here's the, all those charty kinds of things. Um, you know, here's our process. Here's our best practices. Uh, here's some things that are maybe new to you that we want to teach you about. Um, like I said, I, in response to your question, I'll kick off a brainstorm by giving them some of these slides. So, you know, it's a teach part of the do. Ugh, that's awful. I sound like, don't, please. The, um, you know, that you, you're teaching and kind of, um, and it's not, um, here's what, you're not demanding, you're, you're bringing in. And I think that's the, the mission anyway, you know? Yeah. So what you just said, the collaborative environment got me thinking about how it's not just the 
the concept of creating a safe place so you can have bad ideas around it. But like all the tricks you can pull out, you know, like the, I guess in a very physical sense, like sharing food or having, you know, if it's after hours, do it in a place that serves, you know, alcohol or something like that. Maybe not necessarily in the government's dime, I should say, but. Um, but that it's more than just, I guess, approaching it from an intellectual level. You can yeah. actually do these very primal, physical, environmental type of things to set up the environment, right? The yeah. Experience. Yeah. You know, one of the, over the course of my career, you know, a lot of the work that I do is is talking to users, is user research. And, uh, you know, in the bad old days, a long time ago, that was not something that we let clients do. This is very difficult. You can only do it yourself. We don't want to let someone else in who's going to say something dumb or wrong. And, you know, we would even, like, I mean, this is going way back, but we would, like, stage on. We'd go back to somebody we'd already talked to or that was a friend of a friend, and that would be where the client could go. Um, and then that started to change, again, a long time ago. And I remember working with a client over a period of time and, like, getting in a car, you know, using... Uh, uh, it was before mobile devices and before, like maybe the early days of MapQuest with the printouts telling you kind of how to get somewhere, uh, trying to find a place to eat after something like that, having these conversations in the car. Like all the work took place backstage and these kinds of shared experiences, um, you know, were just huge for the relationship but also the content. You can have a conversation in the car back from a discussion with, you know, a family who's going to buy the product. Uh, different than you would have in a debrief session, a teleconference, where you're kind of, you know, you're kind of more responsible. And, and, and um, you know, it loosened me up, it loosened them up, it created, as Dana said, uh, kind of part of the whole experience. So, yes, I think, and I think you can continue to be creative and looking for ways to make the work and the, the theater of the work, you know, represent the kind of collaboration that you want to have. think that um, it's the meh ideas that really suck the life out of a project. Yeah. So what's your recommendation for dealing with the meh ideas? <laughs> I think, you know, I think sorting and prioritizing can be kind of helpful. Um, you know, I mean, to me, it, it's, it's, it's a cycle of sort of generate and sort and generate and sort. Um, um, you know, and, and sort of seeing what you've got. So I wouldn't like to stop and kind of re reflect on the meh too often, but, um, you know, there are sort of, I mean, it, to me it's like a, you, go, you think divergently and then you think convergently. Um, you know, and so we'll do things like just we have sort of, you know, um, ways of voting and kind of, you know, creating priorities for things. Um, and you sort of see what those things produce. I think the meh ideas also are part of the process. Like you have to, they might be in that first hump. And you're right, some of those I said are things that you should do, which are sort of, I don't know what you would call that. Um, it's sort of the, it's the hygiene. And I don't know if that's a meh idea. It doesn't like, no one's gonna get excited about, you know, fixing a typo on a page, but well, actually there are some people that are excited about that and we need them, we need them. Um, but to sort of understand that that's not the same as creating new, you know, digital capabilities that work across devices. That's harder and bigger, um, and you kind of need all of them. Yeah, I don't know. That's I have a, it's a terrible answer to your question. So, I don't know. No, that's all right. It's that's my I should apologize. Um, you know, I, I think meh ideas are. If I had to think about it a little more, I guess meh ideas are great as an output. Um, but if you're trying to provoke, if you're trying to, you know, think in this different way, um, you need to sort of, it's why I'm calling them bad. It's a little more of a, you know, it's an uncomfortable kind of term. Um, and so just to feel the, to feel empowered by the bad and maybe, you know, maybe meh, it's just part of kind of cleaning things up and that we need to do. It's part of the work. people want to be safe rather than be in danger. I mean, that's kind of human nature. And so we may look at these big ideas, but then we're going to gravitate towards the meth ones because they're safer. And so then how do we kind of pull, you know, I, I call it rubber banding, you know, yeah. where you pull the rubber band out and it's too hard to hold it over here, so you kind of get yeah. it back here. And so the meth ideas are almost like this. And so how, you know, you kind of 
you know, build those muscles, I guess, um, in a way to, I think that when you're talking about hmm. those like, safe zones is really important, but then you know, when you start operationalize, do you kind of go rubber band back to that? It's just, a, I agree with you, but I'm also acknowledging that I've had the opposite experience with a lot of clients where the thing that they're asking us to understand is like game changing opportunities. And, um, you know, we, uh, colleagues and I used to make a joke that we should have a default slide that goes in every presentation, which is first of all, get your house in order. I mean, because you go and talk to people about their experience with something and you're trying to sort of see where they're at and see what the potential for this thing is, and they're just bleeding, trying to log on or sort or get access. Like, just stuff is broken. Um, and I feel like, oh, maybe we're sort of, a, there's, we're willing to fund these kinds of things, these explorations, and no one's willing to take on the, like, just sort this out. And so I find myself, you know, I don't use the label innovation consultant, but that's sort of the category that I'm in and I'm being asked to go look at these delightful things and I feel like the strategic advice we come back and give is like you guys need to clean this up because no one can do it and you haven't got a platform for trust where you can start taking people into these kinds of new experiences and you, you know you haven't demonstrated that you're credible and your ability to deliver that and by the way you can hear people's pain around all these things so the solutions are kind of mad it is kind of this 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 not very exciting thing um, but I just feel like it's so badly done. I took the metro in today, and you know, I had a totally mad, I mean, I had a bad experience, but the solutions are all mad. Like, why doesn't the receipt printer actually print out a receipt like it's supposed to? And you know, and I'm not going to compl- I don't want to be ill mannered enough to complain about what you know about, you know, here. Um, but you know, that's like that's not an exciting thing to kind of go off and fix. But you know, I'm sure you guys could list 400 things that could just be cleaned up. You know, if someone would just kind of take the effort to do that. So you know, I don't want to work for Metro and like you know, let's figure out how to change, re re envision the face of people moving. Like we need people thinking about that. But we also have a lot of like things we could go do right now to fix something. Um, so I don't know how that goes with kind of your rubber band thing. I feel like. Yeah, so that's my that's my little rant here. How are we on time? Are we are we good? Okay. Uh, the presentation will be recorded, right, Ori, and and available on the blog post. We're also going to have a a recap um, post about the event next week uh, on the 18F blog. Uh, follow Steve at Steve Portugal on Twitter, um, and please uh, join me in thanking Steve for for being here. Thank you, guys. Great discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.